Hey everyone, in today's video we're going to be doing some basic anti-differentiation practice. So the goal of this video is to really strengthen what we've talked about in the last couple of videos with basic anti-differentiation, using the inverse power rule, using and reversing some of our derivative rules and such. Uh, and this will serve as a very good foundation for when we eventually go into things like U substitution, uh, int integration by parts and things like that, which are slightly more advanced, but this will give us a very solid foundation to, su to be successful in those topics. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. A quick note on how to best use this video. So always try each problem on your own. This is really important because the best way to learn math is always active practice. Don't just sit and watch me solve the problem. Make sure you're trying it on your own. Check the solution. This is again just a good way to make sure that you, you're applying the concepts correctly. And watch the explanation to make sure you've understood each aspect. So I do, uh, even if you've got this right, even if you've got the problems right, I do make sure, I, I do really make sure I flesh out all my thoughts on how to work each problem out. So sometimes you might pick up a few nuances that might help you solve future problems. So make sure you watch it anyways, whether you've got the problem right or not. Uh, and then use the table of contents to navigate through to problems as you need. Right? So that's there for you down here. You can navigate to whatever problem you feel like. Before we actually start solving problems, I just want to take one second to point out something in this uh, antiderivatives table here, and that is I actually, made, I actually made a mistake in the way I wrote this rule over here. The natural log of the, in, the antiderivative of 1 over x is actually the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c, not just the natural log of x, as I had written in the previous video in which I showed this table. Uh, and the reason for that is not because the derivative of natural log of absolute value of x is the only thing that gives you 1 over x. The reason is because when we integrate 1 over x, we could potentially have negative values that go into this 1 over x here because 1 over x can take negative values. The natural log of x cannot, right? Because natural log of negative 1 is undefined and so on and so forth. So this absolute value here just makes sure that we don't have to deal with negative values inside the natural log. That's all. Right? So I apologize for the mistake. And uh, yeah, with that, let's just go ahead and continue with our practice problem video here. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our first examples here. So this first one here, x to the 7th over 23 minus 4 over x to the 9th. Now, this is actually an inverse power rule problem, but you might look at this 4 over x to the 9th term and might be a little bit confused about how we might use a power rule on that. But if you remember from our previous video, we can just rewrite that if we take advantage of our properties of exponents we can just rewrite that as 4x to the negative ninth, right? And of course we can take this guy, put him over there, and that looks something that's much more uh, easy to do with an inverse power rule, right? So let's go ahead and do that. So for the inverse power rule, remember we add one to the exponent and divide by what we have left up there. So here we'll have x to the eighth over 23, Right? And now we're going to divide everything by 8, or multiply by 1 eighth. Right? Over here, we're going to add 1, so we're going to have 4x to the minus 8. Right? And then we just divide by minus 8. And we have our plus c. So that's basically all the calculus we need to do. Now we can simplify this a little bit just to make it look a little bit nicer. Right? So we have x to the 8th. 23 times 8 is uh, 178. 160 plus, uh, sorry, that should, my apologies, that should be uh, 184. So 8 times 3 is 24. Awesome, so we've got that. And then over here, well, this 4 and this 8 cancel to give us a half, and this minus sign and that minus sign will also cancel, so we're just going to have 1 half x to the minus 8, and we still have the plus c. So that right there is our final answer. However, we can still do one more thing. We can just check if that answer is correct. And how are we going to check that? Well, we just take a derivative, right? Because remember, what we're finding is the antiderivative. So if I take the derivative of this antiderivative, I should theoretically end up with whatever I have in here, right? If I don't end up with what I have in here, then I've done something wrong. So let's go ahead and do that check real quick. So if we take this, take a derivative of that, so dy dx, of course, just assuming that's y. Well, we bring down the 8. We're just going to use a power rule there, of course. So we're just going to multiply by 8. We've already established that 8, that 184, uh, 8 divided by 184 is going to give us a 1 over 23 times 
x to the seventh. Uh, over here, we're multiplying by minus 8, so we'll have minus 8 over 2 x to the minus 9. These, of course, cancel to give us 4. And if we see, that's exactly what we have. Of course, derivative of c is just going to be 0. And that's exactly what we have up here, right? x to the 7th over 23 minus 4 over x to the 9th. So that answer is correct. And that was not, that didn't take us too long to do. And it's a very useful way just to make sure we are doing the right thing. Right? So that's our first example. Now let's go to problem number two. So once again, just like we saw over here, that fourth root of x doesn't look like it's something we could directly use an inverse power rule on, but it turns out we can. We just have to rewrite it as x to the one fourth. And we'll be good to go. Because right? that's something we can that's an exponent there that that works nicely with our inverse power rule. We're actually not going to use the inverse power rule on 8 on 8 over x. We're just going to do that as it is because we already have a rule for doing this. The, the inverse power, power rule doesn't actually work for this. So we will, well, thankfully, we do have a rule to deal with that. So we're just going to use that, use that, right? So let's go ahead and do this now. Inverse power rule for this first one. We're going to add one. If we think of 1 as 4 fourths, then what we'll have in that exponent there is just going to be x to the 5 fourths. And then we just divide by 5 fourths, right? And this guy right here, the antiderivative of that, is going to be 8 times the natural log of the absolute value of x. And if you recall, the reason we have that absolute value there is just to be sure that we don't have uh, any negative values inside the natural log. Right? And of course, our plus c. And we could maybe tidy this up a little bit more, make that a 4 fifths. Right. We can make that a absolute value of x plus c, and that's a good final answer over there. Okay, and now once again we can go ahead and do a quick check, just to be sure we've done the right thing. So we can find our dy dx. Right. Um, we use a power rule on here, well, 5 fourths and 4 fifths are reciprocals, so they'll cancel out. So we'll, just left, we'll be left with a 1 there times x, and uh, we'll be left with an x to the 1 fourth, because 5 fourths minus 1 is 1 fourth. Again, when we are taking the derivative of this, since the only reason we have that absolute value in there is to tell, to tell us that we don't want any negative values of x inside the natural log, when we take a derivative, we don't really need to care about that, so we can just we can just write that as uh, 8 over x. Right? We just treat it like we would the regular natural log. And derivative of c is 0. This matches what we have up here, so our answer is correct. All right, next set of problems here. So this first one here, we're starting to see some trig, so we will need to flex some more of our identities here. Now, the first part of this, that's the cosine of x, is pretty uh, pretty straightforward. But this next part here looks a little bit daunting, right? Because we don't really have an identity for this particular, uh, you know, for tangent times cosine. And, you know, it's uh, it, we haven't yet studied how to take uh, integrals of products of functions just yet. However, there is still something that we could do. So let's look at this a little bit more closely uh, up here. So you'll recognize that, well, we'll keep the cosine of x over here. But we can rewrite this tangent of x as sine of x over cosine of x, right? And when you do that, this cosine and this cosine cancel. So really, this tangent of x times cosine of x just really simplifies down to sine of x, right? That's pretty cool. So we can really just rewrite this entire integral as well, we have negative cosine of x plus, we have that 3 there, 3 sine of x dx. And that's much, much nicer for us to do, right? So let's go ahead and now just do this. So the antiderivative of cosine of x is just sine of x, right? If you remember our table, but we have to also preserve this minus sign here. And now the antiderivative of sine of x, now be careful here, is actually going to be negative cosine of x. 
and the three just tags along, right? Because, and we'll talk about why in just a second here. And of course we have our plus C. So that right there is gonna be our final answer. So now let's go ahead and do our check to see if that right there is our, uh, is in fact correct. So if we take our derivative, right? The derivative of sine of x is just a positive cosine of x, right? Look at that negative sign, we get a negative cosine of x. Now the derivative of cosine of x actually produces negative sine of x. So this minus, this minus sign here goes away, so you get negative sine of x. Yeah, derivative of c is just zero. So really, so and that really goes back to why we have this, why the antiderivative of uh, sine of x is negative cosine, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So when you go backwards, it uh, works like that. So, and of course we can just, just looking back at our check, we can see this and this match. So we can conclude that our final answer is correct. Awesome. So now let's move on to our next example. So we have the integral of x cubed over 12 minus three to the x dx. So for this guy right here, we are going to use an inverse power rule, but for this guy, there's an identity that we're gonna use. Right? So let's just go ahead and do it. This one is pretty quick. So again, we're gonna add one, and so we'll have x to the fourth over 12, and then we're just gonna divide by four or multiply by a fourth. And for this guy here, the antiderivative is actually going to be, we still have the three to the x, but we're gonna divide by ln of three, right? And then of course we have our plus c. We could clean this up if we wanted to. We can just quickly say, all right, so we have x to the fourth over 48 minus three to the x over ln of three. And this natural log does not have an absolute value. That's only for the one over x case. Everybody else, we don't really, we don't use that, uh, plus c. Right, and that right there is our final answer. Wonderful. So let's go ahead now that we have that, let's just go ahead and do a quick check. So come down here and check. And so we're gonna take this derivative and using power rule on the first one, well, the four comes down, uh, four over 40 is just 12. So we have, again, we have x cubed over 12. Now up here, we're gonna have the derivative of three, so we can just pull the one over ln of three out as a constant and just take the derivative of three to the x and if we do that, we get, remember the derivative of three to the x is three to the x ln of three and factoring out that other ln of three, we'd end up with this and over here, that ln of three and that ln of three will cancel so we're just left with this one three to the x over here and so this would match this, and so this and that definitely match. So we have x cubed over 12, x cubed over 12, three to the x, three to the x, and of course the derivative of that c once again is zero. So this perfectly matches that. So our answer is correct. All right, next example here. So we have the integral of e to the pi minus e to the x plus cosecant squared of x. Now, this first term right here, this e to the pi is actually a constant. Now we don't, we haven't explicitly talked about a rule for how to take the antiderivative of constants, but the inverse power rule does provide for that. So if we, we can read, we can think about this constant right here as being the same thing as e to the pi times x to the zeroth power, right? Because x to anything to the zeroth power, except zero itself perhaps, is just one, right? So e to the pi, this would be the same thing as e to the pi times one or just e to the pi. And so if I were to use my inverse power rule on this, well, if I could use my inverse power rule on this, and so what I'd get then is I'd have e to the pi times x to the zero plus one, all divided by one, or in other words, just e to the pi times x to the first power. Next term over here, e to the x, that's even nicer as a matter of fact, because e to the x, remember, is its own derivative, so e to the x is also its own antiderivative. So that's really, really nice. Now, cosecant squared of x, well, you might remember that for the antiderivative of cosecant squared of x, 
is going to be um, negative cotangent of x, right? So we're going to have negative cotangent of x plus c. And that's going to be our final answer. Sweet. Now we can go ahead and check this. Right? So let's go ahead and do that. So if we take the derivative, well, the derivative of e to the x, e to the pi times x, well, that's just a linear function. So we can take the derivative just going to be the slope. So it's just e to the pi. And that also further illustrates how this comes about. If you just have a slope in there and you add a differentiate, you get a linear function. And when you take a derivative, you go back to just the slope, right? if that makes sense. And then the antiderivative e to the x, once again, is just e to the x. The derivative of e to the x, excuse me, is just e to the x again. Derivative of cotangent of x, remember, again, here's another example of where those signs are very important. Derivative of cotangent of x is actually going to be negative cosecant squared of x. So we'd have negative, negative cosecant squared of x, right? And these minus signs will cancel, giving us a net positive, right? So our, we'll end up with e to the pi minus e to the x plus cosecant squared of x. And that exactly matches what we have up here. So we have, we have done a good job here. Awesome. Next example now. So now we have 3x to the e minus cosecant squared of x times sine of x. So once again, this looks a little bit weird, but again, we can just think about this in fundamental rules. This, it's really weird to see e in the exponent, but fundamentally, e is just a constant, right? And so we can just treat this as x to some constant, which means it's just going to be an inverse power rule. So don't be afraid by it. Don't get, don't get thrown off by the e over there. I, it's, I deliberately made it that way to be a little bit confusing looking, but it's still just a, still just a constant and an inverse power rule problem. As for this one right here, again, we run into that issue that we haven't, we haven't really seen this in our identities, and we haven't really, you know, uh, we don't yet know how to deal with products of functions when we're integrating. But once again, let's take a look at this a little bit more closely. Maybe let's do it in blue this time. So if we look a little bit more closely, well, let's keep the sine of x over here. But remember, cosecant of x is nothing more than 1 over sine of x. So these two things are really just multiplica multiplicative inverses. And so this sign and that sign canceled. So all we're left with is just 1. So this entire thing just boils down to 1. So we can just rewrite this integral as 3x to the e minus 1 dx. Really, really nice. So let's go ahead and do this. So again, we're just applying the inverse power rule. So we're going to add 1. So we'll have 3x e plus 1. And then we're just dividing by e plus 1. And as for this, remember, it's a constant. So we're just going to tag on an x and then plus c, and that's it. And that's our final answer. And now, of course, let's make sure we check this. Right, so we can take that derivative. Well, we can, if we use the power rule, well, this, this e plus 1 is going to come down here. So it's going to cancel out with this other e plus 1. So we're going to be left with just a 3x because everything in the denominator goes away. And then we subtract 1 from up here. So we're just left with an e. And as for this, well, derivative of x is just going to be 1, or minus 1 in this case, because we have a negative sign. And then the plus c just goes away. So we're left with this. And this perfectly matches what we have up here. So we are correct. All right, a couple more examples here. Now, for these two problems, you'll notice that they're kind of not quite um, you know, in the form that we're used to, we've been seeing so far. But if we do a little bit of simplification, we can actually make them look a lot more like that. So for this one, we're going to start by splitting up the fraction. And we can even split this up into two separate integrals if we like. So we're going to split up, we're going to split up this fraction. And if we do that, we're going to get x over 3x. Like I said, we can split up the thing into two different integrals if we want to. You don't have to, but it's a nice, it's a nice way to sort of compartmentalize each piece. dx, yeah. 
and then we can make a cancellation right over here. So this x and that x will cancel out. So we're just left with a one third in here, just the, the constant one third. All right. So now we can go ahead and integrate each piece. Again, we have a constant here. So just like we saw previously, when we were integrating a constant, we can just tag on an x, right? Because again, constant is the same thing as constant times x to the zero. We add one that's just like adding an x here. So we just multiply an x here when we have a constant. So we have x to the one, uh, one third times x, excuse me, minus, and over here, we can factor out of four thirds, right? Because nothing really cancels here. We can factor out of four thirds, and then we have a one over x in here. And if you remember, the integral of one over x is simply going to be ln of absolute value of x plus c. And that right there is our final answer. We can go ahead and check this. So, a little check here. Then, if we take our derivative, this is going to be, again, derivative of one third x is just going to be a one third, the constant. And over here, well, we have a four thirds derivative natural log of x is just going to be one over x. And then the derivative plus c is zero. So that already matches kind of what we split the fraction into up here. But if we wanted to just show the full form, well, we could try um, putting these fractions together. So we could, um, well, we could multiply this numerator and denominator by x to make a, to get the, get the common denominator. So we have uh, 1x over 3x. If we put those together, what we'll end up with is x minus 4 over 3x. And that's exactly what we started with up here. So this checks out. Wonderful. Now let's look at our next example. So this one is pretty similar in essence, just like we talked about. So the first step in this, just like that, we're going to actually go ahead and distribute this x, this uh, eighth root of x to each of these terms. And again, that's just to make this uh, product here into something a little bit more like what we've seen. So if we do that, we're going to get x to the, well remember x to the first times x to the 1 8th, which is the same thing as the 8th root of x, so it's just going to be x to the 9 8 dx minus, well then we just have an x to the 1 8 there. Okay, and now we can go ahead and just use our inverse power rule. For this guy right here, again we're adding 8 eighths over here, so I think that's going to come out to uh, x to the 17 over 8 and of course, we have to multiply by 8 seventeenths, right? Because we'd be dividing by 17 over 8. Minus, well, we're adding 8 eighths again. So this is going to be x to the 9 eighths. And this time we multiply by 8 over 9 and plus c. And that right there is our final answer. We can check this again. We can check this as well. So if we do our quick check, we can see. If we take our derivative, we can, well, using a power rule here, we have x to, this is going to give us the 17 eighths and the 8 seventeenths cancel. So that just gives us an x to the, well, um, 9 over 8 minus x to the 9 over 8 times 8 over 9. Well, that's going to just give us an x to the, this is going to give us a 1 over there because those two cancel. And then we'll have x to the 1 over 8 and the c goes away. And now if we want this again is exactly what we have up here in the step after we simplified. If we wanted to go overkill, we could factor out an x to the 1 8th out of all of this. So we'd have uh, x to the 1 8th. We have x minus 1, right? Because this is, um, yeah, we have x, we would have x to the first times x to the 1 over 8th there. And this right here is exactly what we have up there, right? Because x to the 1 8th, once again, is the same thing as 8th root of x. So this also checks out. All right, last example here. So we have the antiderivative of 8 over 1 plus x squared plus 7 times 8 to the x plus sine of x dx. So all kinds of things coming together for this final example in this video. So this first one here might look really intimidating at first glance because it doesn't really simplify any further. Uh, it doesn't really look like we can use an inverse power rule and, you know, there's, um, you know, it doesn't look like there's a lot we can, we can really change here. But if you think back to our identities, this is really just going to be the antiderivative of arctangent of x, or inverse tangent of x. Right? And of course, we have to multiply by 8. 
So this first guy here is just going to be 8 times the inverse tangent of x. Now this, first, this next term here, it's important to realize that the 7 is treated as a constant here, and this 8 to the x is the, the real function that we need to integrate, so to say. So we have 7 times 8 to the x over ln of 8, just like we saw previously. Yeah. And this last one here, again, the, uh, the antiderivative sine, just like we saw previously, is going to be negative cosine of x, and of course plus c. So that was quite quick as a matter of fact. So let's just do one final check just to make sure that this is correct and then we'll, we can call it a day. So if we check, well, take our little derivative. Well, the derivative of our tangent of x, well, we know it's just going to be 1 plus x, 1 over 1 plus x squared. So we have 8 over 1 plus x squared. Yeah. Um, for this one right here, once again, we see that same kind of pattern. Right? So up here in the numerator, derivative of 8 to the x, we, we treat the 7 and this ln of 8 as constants. So we factor them out. And up here in the, in the numerator, the derivative of 8 to the a to the x is going to be 8 to the x times ln of 8 divided by ln of 8. Right? And derivative of cosine, of course, is going to be negative sine. So we have minus negative sine of x. Right? So if you think simplify, this ln of x, this ln of x cancel, leaving us with just 8 to the x. This minus sine and this minus sine cancel, so we're just left with a positive. Here, so we have a positive sine of x. Yeah? And so if we look at this again, that's exactly what we started with, right? So we have 8 over 1 plus x squared, 7 times 8 to the x. These ln of a's are both gone. And then we have a positive sine of x, just as we were looking for here. So that's the end, that's the end of this video. I hope you found this helpful. Make sure you practice this kind of stuff as much as you can, because this is really fundamental stuff and will be very important um, as we go through this course. And of course, for things this simple, at least at this level, make sure you're always checking your answers with a quick derivative. Like we, it took us a little bit longer because we actually did this all out in, by, in, by hand, which you're also welcome to do. But if you were to just you know, take a few seconds and do this, do this derivative in your head, you could still save yourself a lot of points. So be, be sure to do that every single time, at least at this level where the derivatives are still pretty simple. So that's it. I hope you found this helpful and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. If you found this video helpful, please do like, share, subscribe, leave a comment and check out some other videos. See you next time!